Good evening Bimblers and welcome to Bimble HQ The Garage Tonight's Bimble is a special Halloween Bimble that's right, a spooky Bimble and we're going to be visiting some of the locations from this book by Wally Barnes Ghosts, Mysteries and Legends of Old Warrington It's a very sought after book goes for about £42 on eBay but luckily, my sister's a goth, so she had a copy of it. So let's stop messing about, and let's spooky bimbo. <laughs> During the summer of 1927, there were several sightings of a ghostly figure peeping through people's bedroom windows. That figure became known as Springheel Jack, but Warrington wasn't the only place that Springheel Jack was spotted. He was originally spotted in London, in the Victorian era. He was described by Londoners as having a frightful appearance. Very tall, with red glowing eyes and clawed fingers and he would breathe blue phosphorescent sparks out of his mouth and he wore a cloak and a white oilskin shirt the first appearance of a spring Jack type character came in 1803 and he was dubbed the Hammersmith Ghost and he appeared to a lone walker in the dead of night and he was described as before however Wally Barnes described him as much more of a Inspector Gadget style character with iron springs in his hobnail boots. On the 14th of August 1927, Springheel Jack was spotted again in Warrington, this time on Haydock Street, which is just down from Central Station where we are now. As an aside, my granddad used to live on John Street just round the corner, and apparently a gang of 50 men chased Springheel Jack from John Street to here at Central Station. However, my granddad never mentioned that. And if you're thinking that my granddad is spring Jack, well, you'd be bang wrong, because he was described as being tall, and my granddad was about five foot five. The last sighting of spring Jack here in Warrington was here at Warrington Central, and when he was cornered, he bounded over the walls of the station and over the tracks and made his escape. And when the mob made their way round to the other side of the station, obviously, they couldn't get over the wall like spring Jack. He was gone, and daubed on the wall was this. When the fields are white with daisies, I'll return. Wally Barnes quotes him as saying, I will never return, which has been much more accurate. Let's bimble.
you join me by one of the only surviving sections of the Old Key Canal. And there's a little bit of local folklore about the Old Key Canal. And a woman called Ginny Greenteeth. It was a tale told to children to get them to stay away from the Old Key Canal. But it wasn't only a tale that was told in Warrington. It's told in Lancashire and most of Cheshire and Staffordshire and a little bit of Shropshire. She's known as Ginny Greenteeth to us, but she's also called Jenny Greenteeth and Wicked Jenny and Jeannie Greenteeth. There are similar tales told to children all around the world. In Japan they have Kappa and in Australia they have Bunyip and in Jamaica they have River Mama. That's my favourite. The story in and around Warrington focuses around the Old Key Canal and it features an old woman called Jenny Gretchley. She lived in a cottage on Old Moor Lane and she got the reputation for taking in tramps and she would feed them and bathe them and let them sleep in a cottage and when they were asleep she would chop them into little tiny bits and she would take those bits over the Old Key Canal to a pond in the part of Warrington where they built Thames board paper mills in the 1930s and anything that was put in the pond would be swallowed up by the thick green weeds so it was the perfect place for her to dump bits of old tramp it's believed that she killed seven or eight tramps in this fashion and one day some children were playing by that pond and they seen some bits of old tramp floating along so they went and told their parents the parents informed everyone and the townsfolk formed a mob and they went and knocked on Jenny Gretchley's door but she wasn't in so they broke down the door and when they were in a cottage they found bundles of old rags that looked like old tramps clothes it was 40 years later when a local farmer was walking past the pond that he stood frozen an old hag was stood knee deep in the green weeds and she was beckoning to him he was stood frozen and he watched her disappear before his eyes some years later some workmen were digging around there and apparently they found an old woman's skeleton that's according to Wally Barnes anyway could that old woman have been Ginny Greenteeth did she go back to the pond to dispose of the evidence we'll never know but she wasn't all bad because she did keep a lot of children away from rivers and canals. Let's bimble. I'll never let it go. You find in time. I'll never let it go. You find it's right. I'll only ever know how to speak my mind. I'll only ever know how to speak my mind. To me, it was a long mistake. To reapply those lazy arms in my heart. To you it was a dream it mended. To you it was a dream suspended. The tale of the crawling man starts here in Sankey Bridges in 1912 when a man named Len Kay was operating the swing bridge over the Sankey Canal. There's quite a number of bridges round here, hence the clever name Sankey Bridges. Len Kay reports that one evening he's seen a man crawling along the floor clutching his chest and when he went to help the man he disappeared. It wasn't the only sighting of such a thing. In 1860, one of the people that lives on Old Liverpool Road got a knock on the door at around midnight. And when they answered the door, there was the ghostly figure again, clutching his chest, beckoning them over. And when they went to help, he disappeared. Wally Barnes posits the notion that the origin of the crawling man comes from the Black Horse Inn on Old Liverpool Road. He believes it goes back to the 1630s during the Civil War here in England. They had a lot of battles around here in Warrington 
and we've bimbled to some places that have a lot to do with the Civil War. On this occasion, having lost the battle, some Royalists were hightailing it out of Warrington and they pulled into the Black Horse Inn to steal all the horses and they demanded that the landlord give them all the horses in the stables and of course he refused. Having refused, one of the Royalists withdrew their sword and stabbed him in the gullet, killing him. At this point, the stable master Giles Boston withdrew his sword and he slit two of the Royalists up a treat and killed them on the spot. The head Royalist pulled out his pistol and shot Giles Boston in the chest before reloading the pistol, which must have took ages, and shooting him again. The remaining Royalists stole all the horses and made their escape and Giles Boston gave chase, clutching his chest because he'd just been shot twice. He made it to the sloop inn on Old Liverpool Road and he slumped down on the floor and died. So Wally thinks it was back in the Civil War that's the origin of the Crawling Man. And I too believe that the origin of that story comes from the Black Horse Inn. But I think it happened much closer to the time and involved a lot of Guinness. Let's bimble. We've said before on this channel, the Sankey Canal is the world's first industrial canal. And the coming of the canals brought people off the rivers, people with no fixed abodes, people who toured up and down the country, touting the wares. And one such man was Gypsy Jack O'Reilly. Him and his mother used to go up and down the canals, going to the summer fates, and his mother was named Gypsy Flora Romano and she would read people's palms and tell the future. As you might expect, telling the future and marauding up and down the canals of the UK, you might make a few enemies. And their enemy in Warrington was a Cornelius Roper. He didn't like the fact that they used to moor up on his land. And on one occasion that they moored up on his land, Cornelius Roper decided to do something about it. Jack and Flora were visiting the Fiddler's Ferry Horse Fair. It was long before you had Fiddler's Ferry Power Station, but apparently they had a golf course round the corner. Once again, Jack and Flora had moored upon Cornelius Roper's land. So he decided he was going to hire a rather large fellow by the name of Jeb Steele. And he tasked him with getting rid of Jack and Flora Jeb Steele went to their barge, picked up Jack and Flora and thrown them in the canal. Jack O'Reilly managed to get himself out of the canal with ease. He was a younger man. But Flora wasn't. She was an older lady and unfortunately she drowned. Obviously Jack O'Reilly was very upset about this and he picked up a sledgehammer and he caved in Jeb Steele's head before he was restrained and taken to the madhouse. But on his way, he put a curse on Cornelius Roper. He said that wherever Cornelius Roper went, he would see his mother's face in water. And apparently it came true. When Cornelius Roper looked into the canal, there was the face of Flora Romano. 
when he washed his face in his wash basin. Flora. When he looked into his pint of bitter, Gypsy Flora Romano's face was there. He was racked with guilt and he withdrew from the world and people didn't see him for months and months until one day in 1894 they found his body washed up in the River Mersey. He'd either taken his own life or Gypsy Flora Romano had dragged him into the river. Who knows? Thank you.